Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Alex Tom for inviting me here today and giving me the opportunity to give a, a Wood Group PSN perspective on the challenges and opportunities we see uh, in the UKCS in reference to skill shortages. Um, I've been in, around this industry for, I think my biog says 37 years, 36 years. I spent 20 years offshore. Um, I come from a skills background, a technical skills background. I don't come from a university background. I've kind of crawled my way up the, uh, the ladder in terms of being a supervisor and a technician and a, an offshore manager to an onshore manager in a range of uh, operational and technical and managerial roles. Um, it's a bit like the sort of, have you ever read the, the, the children's, uh, famous children's Aesop's fables, the tortoise and the hare? Uh, no points for uh, guessing which one I am. Um, Wood Group Engine, I'd like to set a little bit of context in terms of uh, what is Wood Group today. Um, Wood Group's uh, an international services company working in around 50 countries. Um, we've uh, about 42,000 people, turnover of $7 billion a year. Um, and most of our company, uh, most of our company works uh, out with of the UK. So that message would perhaps send uh, that we have to look elsewhere to fulfill our corporate growth needs. Um, but when I took over this role, Serene Wood wrote me a really nice letter and kind of rem reminded me firmly of this is the heartland of the company and uh, the, uh, there's still a, a lot of life left in the North Sea as, as, as uh, Fergus uh, succinctly described there. Probably half a century and, and more value to be recovered than has been extracted today. So um, I'll draw your attention to some of these gold bars, uh, uh, coloured bars on, on the screen. Um, these represent the core values of the organisation. I'm going to talk about a couple of the core values today. Um, the blue one represents safety and assurance, which is the number one core value. Uh, and the gold one in the middle represents uh, people. Um, and without people, uh, we would really, uh, <laughs> really struggle to fulfil our business. So I'd like to describe a little bit how we uh, bring them to life today. Um, but uh, before I do that, I'd like to, to sort of reflect on uh, a bit of a safety moment. Um, Fergus mentioned there about uh, Piper Alpha. Um, I attended uh, some of the three-day conference uh, last week here in this very venue. Um, and Fergus also mentioned about, uh, about the, the video, um, which was, was tremendous. And I'd certainly encourage everyone to see it if you've not already seen it. It was very thought-provoking on you know, remembering and reflecting on the 6th of July when 167 uh, of our colleagues lost their life in that terrible tragedy. I remember it vividly because that night I was a 10-year veteran in oil and gas. I worked on the North Cormorant for, for Shell UK. Uh, and I remember vividly um, huddling around the control room and listening to the emergency radio. Uh, and the messages that were going on that night. Um, when I watched the video, it took me back to that night because what I heard in the video was what I heard that night uh, in terms of the emergency services calls. So, um, but my safety moment, um, you know, considering the, the, the incident, you know, the audience we have today, is, is, is not really about major accidents in, in the UKCS, it, it's, it's more at home. I got reminded last night, um, uh, one of our colleagues at Wood Group Kenny was fatally injured in a car crash uh, this week. Um, and driving is the number one killer uh, and cause of fatalities in our company worldwide. So to take that into the context of the audience today, probably most of us are sort of onshore based uh, and, and we all commute to and fro work and our, our wives and families commute, our, our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters. Um, 
And my safety moment is if anybody can take away something from this, over 10% of uh, road accidents uh, in the UK are attributed to poor weather conditions, wet roads, driving. Um, and there's a phenomenon that occurs called hydroplaning. I'm not sure if everybody's heard of that phenomenon. It was, it's not something I'm that familiar with. But it was brought to my attention through a story of, of an accident that occurred fairly recently. And what hydroplaning is, is um, when road surfaces become wet, especially uh, when you get an initial downpour and the, the road surface changes from dry to wet. Um, that happens pretty regularly in Scotland. I know you remember, it was just this weekend, getting, I was out in a Boyne golf course in the, in the sun and the next five minutes I was putting my waterproofs on and getting deluged. Um, but intuitively, you would say, right, when the rain comes on, you would have done the usual things. You'd make sure your car's in good shape, your tyres in good shape, they're at the right inflation. You would slow down, you would, you would address the, the, the conditions as you've seen them. One thing you may not think about is switching your cruise control off. Um, if you continue to use cruise control on wet roads, there's a danger that your car will go into this hydroplaning uh, state where your tyres will lose traction with the road and effectively you'll lose control of the car. So if you can take it in away from this morning uh, and take it to the home, uh, take away that message, switch off your cruise control in the wet. So what is Wood Group today? I mentioned there we're a, a company made up of three divisions, a Wood Group Engineering, Wood Group PSN and Wood Group GTS, which is our gas turbine services provider. In very simple terms, Wood Group Engineering uh, is, is a, a division that focuses on the greenfield uh, oil and gas market, i.e. the new stuff, you know, that's where they design and build a, a new new platforms, new structures, uh, new subsea structures. Uh, Wood Group PSN is the division I work in. Um, that's a, where we live in the, the brownfield market, and that's in the operating environment. And Wood Group GTS is a gas turbine service division. Uh, Wood Group GTS is the world's largest uh, gas turbine, independent gas turbine service provider. Um, so we write, and I'll focus on we group PSN. Um, we uh, are a provider of brown seal services uh, in the operating environment. So that's anything from sort of conceptual studies, front end engineering, detailed engineering and construction, operational readiness, operations and maintenance, from a labor supply right through to a, a full blown duty holder and operating service and decommissioning. Um, so anything that can, uh, is in the operating environment, uh, we, uh, we aim to add value to our customers. Um, and what does that value look like? It, it looks like uh, optimising production efficiency. It's a challenge that, is, that we all face in the industries today. Um, it's about main, maintaining production and about uh, doing that in a cost-effective way. And Fergus touched succinctly on the cost effectiveness uh, and the rising costs in the industry. Okay, so talk, you know, let me talk about uh, people core values now. I mean, I think it's really important. I heard the paper, uh, the paper 25 conference, um, that when we talked about major accidents, there was a common theme coming through, and that, that common theme, theme was culture. It was leadership, it was values. It wasn't really procedures. So we're a values-led organization. Um, we try and bring that to life in our everyday working. People uh, are at the heart of that. That sound, might sound a bit cheesy. That's why the core value is gold and it's in the middle. Um, but we're a professional high-performing uh, team. Um, and we, you know, we, we really focus in, on forming a network that can deliver expertise and value to our clients. Uh, we treat each other with uh, honesty and compassion and respect, and we create a, a stimulating, uh, fun and open work culture. So why is that so important? Um, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. If, if we actually don't have good people 
highly competent and focused on safety and delivery, then we will fail to meet our ambition. Our ambition is to be the best company to work for, the best company to work with, uh, and based on a culture of continuous improvement. So in the UK, that translates into an organisation of 8,500 people. Um, you can see the split there, 5,000 offshore, 3,500 onshore. Um, and then we'll talk about the, some of the initiatives we are doing to, uh, to train and develop people. We've got 430 graduates and trainees, and re-engineers, apprentices in our business today, uh, or coming into the business in this year's intake. Um, we've got 62 re-engineer staff um, on, that we've brought into the business from our uh, re-engineering programme, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail. Um, however, we have a 55 to 45 percent contract to the staff ratio in our onshore uh, workforce. So what does that mean? Uh, it kind of means that it's slightly unbalanced. Um, some of our competitors have higher ratios than that. And I'm going to talk a little bit what that actually means to the industry. Um, and I've just mentioned there about our core value about attracting, uh, mobilising, developing and retaining staff. Can we talk a little bit about um, some of the things we're doing to attract? Uh, some of the things we're doing to sort of develop and retain. Um, so it's, I'll just uh, skip to that. Um, one of the, the bullets on there, I'll, I'll talk about how we get people, but I'll also tell about, talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we do when we can't get people. And some of the initiatives we're taking on board there to get people out of Aberdeen. So strategic resourcing, what's that? Um, what we've tried to do in the company is, is split out uh, recruitment, resourcing or attracting people into the company at the highest level. So we've got a, a, a director on the, on, the, on the board whose sole purpose in life is to attract people into the company. So that's a little bit different from the normal HR because uh, normally in most organisations uh, HR handle recruitment. Uh, so, um, this sort of area of the business manages our trainee development programs uh, in conjunction with our technical support functions, i.e. the people who set the standards, um, and it manages, manages the, the graduate intakes, the, the apprentices, the trainee designers, the, the design academy was set up, uh, and the re-engineering program. We've also invested in, in, in other areas of uh, systems and process, uh, technologies like iRecruit, which gives us a, a better technology of opening up to a wider network. We've invested in social media. I can, don't do that myself personally, but um, uh, our recruitment team is on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and they're and they uh, in LinkedIn. Um, so we've got a range of initiatives set up um, to uh, attract people so we've got things like where you want to be campaigns and that's really focused on our mid-range population i.e graduates who come out of the uh, out of the training and we accelerate them into the business and give them opportunities to attempt to retain them um, we have a headline i'm not proud to say this but we have around 50% of the graduates leave the business within two years of uh, being fully trained. Where do they go? Well, they go to their competitors, they go to their clients. But in the main, they switch from being staff employees to uh, agency contractors um, because the, the culture is they're kind of surrounded by uh, agency contractors. And that's no bad thing because we actually need... Um, we need contractors in our business to manage the peaks and troughs. I personally think that the balance is, is switched a little bit too much. Um, so we've, we've, we've tried to assess that talent and put them in a box. What does that box look like? It looks like a gold box or a silver box. Again, that might sound a little bit cheesy, but that's our way of identifying who are our who are a real talent for the future and categorising them and, 
into an area and prioritising them and making sure that they get the right support and development through their careers and an attempt to keep, to keep them. Um, we've also brought in-house our own uh, executive uh, search capability. What does that mean? It means we've got our own headhunter. So then he's got a call from our man. Um, at least we won't have to pay a massive fee. Um, but, but I guess that's really focused on uh, trying to search for exclusive talent um, in and around the industry, and that is a slow process. Um, in 2013, earlier this year, we went on tour <coughs> in the UK. Um, we had four events uh, around Glasgow, Newcastle, Inverness, and Liverpool, where we had over 5,000 people through the door. Um, I do have a video on that, but I probably not have time to, to show it today, but uh, it, it was a bit like the X factor, the cues to get in the door. So that shows you there's a demand for people to get in, in the, the oil and gas industry. I mean, from the sessions, we actually signed up 100 people and hired them on the spot because we had the competent people there to test their base skills. Now, once we uh, assured the base skills, we had to then put them through training programs to mobilize them into the field. Um, we've got training providers working on seven days a week at the moment uh, to fulfill our, uh, our shutdown campaigns where we need approximately a thousand extra people in a short period of time. And it's most important that we have competent people with the right culture and the right attitudes and behaviour when we're importing risk into our asset base. Um, so that's been very, very successful, but it's, it's only one part of a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and, and to get people up to the levels of competence we expect, I sit on the Step Change leadership team um, where the industry has been focused on things like bolt, bolt joint and competence, small bore fittings, all of the things that prevent hydrocarbon leaks, lower compliance, things that prevent uh, accidents from falling from height. So we really got to be careful that we assess people and give them the right, uh, not only augment their base skills, we get them into the right mindset and the right set of behaviours. So that's a little bit about strategic resourcing. I'm talking a little, little bit about people development, and, and this, is, um, this is where HR come in. There's not much good in uh, you know, um, investing and attracting staff when you, you don't develop them uh, and, and you don't retain them. We place a lot of health, uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on or organisational health through succession planning and career development. Um, nothing unusual about that. So. The other thing we've done this in the last two years is we've launched uh, staff, targeted staff conversion programs uh, in a bid to identify key staff uh, from our contracting community and convert them into long-term uh, staff to meet our, our, our insatiable appetite for, for resources. Um, that's a limited success, if I'm being honest, because um, the ones we recruit, you know, there's somebody else pops out the, the door at the other end. Um, but it has a, a limited success. What I will say is we're absolutely focused on making sure that the leadership in the company and the 8,500 people company in the UK, where we have about 70 people who, in, who are in key influential positions, all of them will be staff. Um, they're the ones who set the tone, they're the ones that set the culture, they're the ones that set the values. Um, it's quite difficult to maintain a safe, high-performing culture in a transit organisation that's dominated by people who are churning around. Um, we also think it's uh, we, we've got a, a picture there that says my success plan. What is that? That's an, a, that is a, a new way of, of our people taking accountability and ownership of their own career as opposed to sitting waiting for their annual appraisal. So it's a more interactive way of, of our people driving their own careers and their own development. And it's something that we promote uh, on an ongoing basis rather than an annual basis. Um, we're also working in close collaboration with the Taylor Clark Group. Uh, Taylor Clark's a, an organization based in Glasgow Management Consultants. They've been working with us for a number of years on 
developing our, our uh, staff in safety leadership and management development. Um, and we've also embarked on a 360 feedback program for that sort of 70 people population. Again, not a lot unusual in that. Um, this is where it gets uh, quite interesting. Um, work share. So in a capacity constrained market, we just cannot get the right skills to carry out the work to meet our forecasted demands. Uh, and we've talked about the, the challenges of getting new skills into the industry. I honestly believe with a high number of graduates, trainees, apprentices, re-engineers in our business today that we are doing our bit for the UK, uh, the UK oil and gas. So if we can't get the people to the work, we take the work to the people. So what does that mean? It means we've set up remote offices and invested in work share. Work share is where we have developed, we've invested in systems, processes and controls, technology to get engineering design work done out with all of Aberdeen. We have almost a, a thousand people between our, our work share offices in the UK and a new work share office in Delhi in India. Um, last year they delivered over a million work share hours to uh, to UK oil and gas industry and to our customer base. That's been tough because a lot of our customers say you can't do the work out of Aberdeen, I need, to, I need the guy in the office, I need to look in the whites of his eyes. Um, you know, how can we possibly do work in Glasgow? How can we do it in Runcorn? How do we manage the interfaces? All these challenges. But I think we've demonstrated uh, that taking the work to the people in an interim way of just not being able to get the skills has, has, has been hugely successful. So we've also invested in, in uh, setting a remote engineering office up in Delhi. In India, we've got 40 highly skilled people so what does that do for the UK industry? Skill shortage? Not a lot. What it does, it plugs a gap for us. That Indian office is really a, there to support other regions, but it's got resources that we can tap into. Um, I have to say we've experienced real reluctance to get any work into India. Um, I kind of struggle with that on a personal level. Um, especially with a concept of, if you look at our own National Health Service, it is kind of bristling with highly skilled Indian surgeons, consultants, and we're kind of happy enough to let these people operate in ourselves and our families and our children. But we kind of struggle with sending them a, an as built PIN ID to check uh, or do a bit of design work for us. So there's a bit of cultural uh, pressure to overcome there. We've got over 200 vacancies in the UK today. So what does that mean for me? It means I don't deliver to my clients because I don't have enough resource to fulfill everybody's obligations. And it also means we lose profit and yet I've got a resource pool uh, that we can fulfill. Um, so that's a big challenge. Uh, one of the benefits of moving to, work to these locations is we see our staff uh, and our contractor turnover rates being a lot less in these locations. I guess it's because Maybe all our competitors aren't there and they go home at night and they spend their time with their families. So let me talk a little bit about re-engineer. Um, re-engineer is, uh, is a conversion program that we've been uh, working now for about six years. Um, it's something we're very proud of. We're very proud of the program. I guess what I'm not so proud of is, is by the low numbers of people we've had through it. We've only had 62 people uh, either through or in the program. Um, so what does that look like and what are the benefits of it? Um, and there's an initial eight week training course that we've uh, developed in collaboration with ECITB um, to prepare you know, the, the re-engineers with the necessary skills, knowledge and competence to, to work in the environment. So that kind of gets the base level of you know, a, an NVQ level two. We then ship them offshore um, and that's the hard part. The offshore part is a further 18 months a development program, typically spending as much time as possible in the field um, and some of our busiest projects. 
Uh, and after that period, they will end up with a, being fully qualified with a, a level three NVQ. Each individual actually already comes with a, a you know, a sense of, uh, you know, a real high, high level of skill and experience. Um, we see low turnover rates of these, these people. We see high work ethic. We see high levels of leadership. Um, and we see high levels of motivation. Um, and, and to a man, I have had 100% positive feedback from not only our own leadership uh, and our own management supervision, but their clients. Uh, the team working and the team ethic is kind of inbuilt into the military people, um, and it's hugely successful. But we can't just do enough of it um, because of some of the challenges we face. So, let me talk a little bit about challenges. This is where I might get a little bit controversial. So. Um, so I've categorised some of these challenges that we face in the on, onshore and offshore. Um, the industry is certainly facing a major problem of uh, what I would call the big problem. And that for me is rising costs and low production efficiency. The data tells us as an industry we only achieve 60% production efficiency. We've got an ageing infrastructure which is in decline, it needs a lot of care and attention, it's had a lot of neglect. Uh, we've not only neglected the skills that we need to manage the industry, we've also neglected the asset base in which we work on. So to extend the life of that asset base, it needs a high level of shutdown. Shutdowns cause deferment. Production efficiency levels have been low. Costs are high. That is a bad dynamic. The dynamic of high costs and low efficiency will shorten the life of the industry. So instead of 50 years, we may have 40 years. These are big issues that we face. Uh, it's no great surprise to see the formation of a pilot work group focused on addressing the issue uh, through collaboration led by Jim House of Apache. I'm delighted to see that. It's long overdue. I honestly believe if we tackle production efficiency in the UK like we've tackled safety with a sort of leadership focus and an industry focus, we'll be successful. Um, so my point that may address the production is, is, uh, is not specifically addressing production decline, but the challenge of rise in costs, which is a different matter altogether. I can see lack of uh, trust and collaboration between the operators and organizations like ourselves and the competitors. I see engineering facilities teams rising in the operators' organizations um, and lack of organizational integration. I see less and less of the one team culture and the one team approach. What I do see is operators scrambling for engineering resources and ourselves scrambling for engineering resources and project engineers managing project engineers and high, high levels of inefficiency and organizational inefficiency and lack of trust and collaboration. Um, I see loads of man marking, I see complex management of change processes where I guess on the backdrop of you know, Texas City, Macondo, there's a huge emphasis on assurance. I'm not sure we've got that right as an industry. I think sometimes we muddle up delivery and assurance and we get the balance wrong. Um, and, and I see a high level of inefficiency. So my challenge to the industry would be, have a look at your own organizations. Do you really believe that they're efficient? Do you really believe that you trust your contractor to deliver the solutions that you need? Do you think that defining the problem and the solution and, and spending all your engineering time and, and passing a baton over to your contractor um, and, and getting them to deliver something they don't kind of believe in or don't agree with. I think the model is kind of flawed. Some, of, some, some companies have got it right, some companies are struggling with it, and some companies have got it flatly wrong. Um, so on the backdrop of that sort of level of inefficiency, I actually think if organizations shaped up and faced up to these challenges would free up a large portion of the resource into the UK. Um, I also see a lot of Porsches and a lot of Aston Martins in every car park in Aberdeen. 
Um, none of them are mine. <laughs> um, but what, what they generally are are piping engineers and, 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 and day rate contractors. I think we've got the balance wrong. Uh, we actually need day rate contractors. We've got a lot of highly skilled people that support the industry, but when we're running on 80 20 and 55 45 ratios, we've got to be doing something wrong. And when day raters are mark, man marking day raters, uh, we've certainly got something wrong. So, offshore, I see uh, and, uh, some of the, the, the challenges I see offshore are uh, insourcing our own people from by operators. We've seen about 500 people insourced. Now, that in itself doesn't um, really make a, a dent on the industry skill numbers. What it does do is, is uh, it reduces my ability. Um, it it kind of it irks me when we've invested in 500 people in training, developing, making them competent, and somebody just pinches them. So that's kind of back to Ferguson's poaching comment. That is, uh, that is high intensity poaching, I can assure you. Um, but, you know, with high levels of workloads, beds are at a premium. So getting re engineers, getting apprentices, getting trainees offshore and in the field is hugely difficult. Um, with a recent shortfall, uh, Helicopter availability due to the grounding of the EC-225s. Uh, getting beds for training and development is virtually impossible. Um, we also see some levels of it, uh, you know, resistance to accepting and experienced staff in both our own and client organisations, and kind of general resistance to new, new ways of working. And I guess that general resistance is, is kind of comes from the permafrost in the organisation. It's, it's having... Uh, leadership or management and supervision who are actually not focused on the bigger picture um, but more focused on, on their own needs. But, you know, to end on a positive note, I actually believe and firmly believe I've been in this industry for, say, 35, 36 years. I'm immensely proud to be in this industry. I believe the future is extremely bright for the oil and gas sector. Facing up to, ma facing up to the challenge of managing a skill shortage is certainly for me a far better place to be in than having high levels of unemployment and social and economic challenges that that brings. Thank you for listening.